governing body of all other special assessment dis taxing districts for which said board so acts is now meeting in regular session. Only those items that indicate a specific time will be heard at the assigned time. All other items may be taken out of sequence to accommodate the public and staff availability. And at this time, I will make the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have uh, introduction of any new employees today. Yes. Welcome, Stephanie. I had the pleasure of working with Stephanie before through some other stuff. Yes. Any others? Seeing none, uh, report of any actions from closed session by county council. Nothing to report. Thank you. At this time, do we have any deletions or corrections to the agenda? Hearing none, we will move on to receive other brief reports or announcements relative to county of Delmore programs and projects, progress of the two by two committees, et cetera. Madam so Chair. I was going to ask a question in regards to uh, the letter from the Border Coast Airport Authority. If, uh, if Jerry, did you want to pull that one at this time, or did you want to discuss it at all before you? I mean, uh, in yeah, order to meet the staff? I think we'll pull it at, at this time. Uh, um, Jay has mentioned to me that uh, somebody from the Coastal Conservancy is going to be here tomorrow, so we'd like to get a reaction from them. Prior to sending out the letter, so. Okay. What number is that? It's just in letters and. Oh, I'm doing the letters. And, okay. Forty-six. Forty-six. Yeah. Was that the one regarding mitigation? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Supervisor Sullivan, would you like to start, please? Um, mine will be very brief. Uh, I took my uh, family vacation with my son. We went to Washington, Montana. Um, Wyoming, South Dakota, and uh, covered a lot of ground and had rented an RV for it. It was a pretty cool trip. Got a chance to see Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse, uh, Buffalo Bill Museum. Um, it's amazing. South Dakota is really, you could spend a lot of time in South Dakota just based on the tourism stuff. And uh, it, you look at that area and there's, I mean, besides, you obviously have Mount Rushmore and, and, and Crazy Horse, but there's not really environment we've got a much uh, better environment over here but there's just been a focus to encourage tourism over there so it is a really cool area it was my son insisted on listening there they give you a verbal audio thing you carry with you to get the tour of Mount Rushmore and we had to press every single button to hear every single thing so we got the full which was cool he's he loved the fact that they used dynamite to build Mount Rushmore that was extremely cool so <laughs> watch both both films on it so it was definitely a a good trip, and it was cool to see uh, that part of the United States I hadn't seen it yet. So that's it. Yeah, thank you, Very well. Supervisor Hammonds. Yeah. Uh, had uh, action summary um, also filled in for either Supervisor McClure or Supervisor McNamer um, for solid waste uh, management authority uh, because neither one of them could could make the meeting. Uh, had a. Um, uh, local transportation commission meeting uh, where we approved our regional transportation plan which met with uh, uh, some resistance uh, there was quite a few people in the audience that were not in favor of that and I haven't um, I've had some some discussions with some of this constituents but still haven't uh, figured out the reason the total reason behind uh, not uh, not wanting this particular regional transportation plan uh, to go into effect, uh, we have spent quite a little bit of time on it, and the parameters are set um, by the state. So we only have certain areas uh, that we can work within. Different pots of money for uh, for different projects, uh, having to do with uh, uh, road maintenance and uh, pedestrian and transit and airport. So those are the four pots of money. So we have to work within those four pots of money. 
and uh, some people thought that uh, we should be able to move some of the pots of money around, and that just doesn't work. So uh, I, I'm hoping to get uh, more information from some of these people that were uh, voiced uh, opposition uh, to the regional transportation plan so we can get down and find out uh, what we need to do to make things, uh, make things better if we can. Uh, <clears throat> participated in the special closed session that we had. Uh, had a uh, teleconference, uh, Ruth Coleman, who is the uh, head of uh, uh, state parks, uh, called me to give me a heads up on a grazing issue that they've got uh, um, out on uh, Tolowa Dune State Park. Uh, Blake Alexander has been uh, grazing cattle out there for 15 years, I think, and now all of a sudden uh, the, uh, there's an environmental group, EPIC, I believe it is, um, is not wanting that to happen anymore. So um, there's some concern there that uh, hopefully we'll be looking into see if we can't get that resolved. Um, I had a meeting at the harbor and uh, yesterday had a LAFCO meeting um, and uh, you know I just can't say enough about George Williamson as, as no, an example. Can't. I can't, I, you know I just I can't help it. He's, um, he's very proactive. Um, every little thing that comes up, uh, he wants the board to be involved with, uh, whether it be a budget issue or, um, you know, a part of a, a, a district that wants to uh, uh, change their sphere of influence. Uh, you know, whatever that is, he's on top of it. He's, uh, you know, I just, I just can't say enough about the, the work that he puts in uh, and the professionalism that, uh, um, uh, that he has. Uh, so. Uh, it's always a it's always a good meeting uh, when he's uh, when he's in charge. So, and that's about it for me. Thank you. Yeah, I um, started off the last couple of weeks with the meeting of the South Beach Trails meeting. It was the culmination of several meetings and the maps and the planning. We closed out the planning grant, and it was basically the county and uh, Elk Valley Rancheria. Uh, and I'm not sure if the city was involved, but uh, the Caltrans was involved. The parks were involved. Uh, both state and national. Um, so now it goes pretty much in the hands of Elk Valley Rancheria. I think it's going to carry the ball on that and keep funding it to see how to implement something like that. But the maps are finalized. The planning is done. Uh, then I went to Portland. Um, the National Association of Counties met in Portland this time, which was actually closer than Sacramento. So uh, it was uh, easy to get there. Had several meetings. Started early with some of the committee and subcommittee meetings. I sit on the uh, transportation subcommittee and also chair the aviation uh, subcommittee and uh, also participate as a delegate in the uh, member of the Western Interstate Region uh, Board of Directors for the National Association of Counties. So had those meetings, uh, covered all sorts of stuff, so I'm not going to bore you too much. WIR seemed to be focusing on coordination. There was a couple of presentations on that and some uh, good input. Uh, also talked about secure rural schools. There's a couple of takes on whether the presentations are going well in Washington or whether they're not. And so the jury's still out on that. Everybody's aware of the issues. But in the climate of the budget back in Washington, um, we're really getting to a point of gridlock and it's going to affect counties. Uh, the um, Transportation Committee, we put forth 22 resolutions. Uh, to be brought forward by NACO uh, in their platform. Everything from the Highway Trust Fund, Transportation Trust Fund, uh, Short Sea Shipping Initiative, say that real fast a few times, um, Surface Transportation Policy, the, Envir uh, the EAS, Essential Air Service, dealt with all those issues. A lot of good workshops, uh, everything from environmental uh, justice to justice, um, how to deal with uh, camps, probation, how to uh, maximize efforts there uh, in um, what they were doing community gardens but not really community gardens they were more of small farms and then how they would use the, that group of juveniles to teach them a craft but also to produce a product that could then offset some of the budgets and I think we've talked about that locally uh, uh, producing our own food source for some of our inmates but uh, there was some good speakers Bob Woodruff was there he was the guy that was supposed to take over, I think, for the Peter Jennings uh, nightly news that uh, went over to Iraq and hit a bomb and lost half his brain. Uh, anyway, good recovery, slow recovery. 
The most inspirational one was that uh, Aaron Ralston. Aaron Ralston was the 127 hours guy, uh, the guy that had to cut his arm off. And going through that five day process and what he learned was really something. Um, and what it, his definition is, when you think you're having a bad day, uh, he said, well, have you had to do this yet? <laughs> have you had to do that yet? And yeah, then maybe it's not so bad. But uh, anyway, it's really very interesting. Uh, so a lot of good uh, speakers and a lot of good workshops. Came back and uh, attended the close, special closed session as did everybody else. I also received a call from Jeff Baumke regarding Blake Alexander and the, the issue out there and uh, asked him rather than reciting, and, and I thanked him very much for the communication and the heads up, but that he really needed to send a letter to the board. So it wasn't going to be, well, I heard it was this reason and I heard it was that reason and really put it, memorialized as to what really is happening out there and why since it was a, a partnership and started that way. So when you terminate those, everybody should be sensitive to that. I had a meeting with um, um, uh, Jerry, uh, his name's escaping me, Martha, you'll probably chime in here, uh, from Mendocino County League of Cities. Yeah, Mello, correct. And, uh, and staff from Mar um, Mary. And we talked about, they were, Jerry and myself were part of that group that met with um, the Coastal Commission, the actual commissioners. He represented uh, the League of Cities and I represented the State Association of Supervisors. And how do we get that dialogue back again in that direction, especially in light of that there's five new members and Martha being one. So took the opportunity to chat with Martha as a member of the Coastal Commission and, and Jerry as the League of Cities. Very, very good meeting, very meaningful, and I know he appreciated it and took a lot away from it. Had a meeting down at the Trees of Mystery with the Thompsons regarding some of the issues down in Klamath as well as economic development and tourism. His tourism is up. Um, some of the numbers throughout Del Norte County show that tourism has been going down the last three to five years and his keeps going up. Uh, so uh, talked about ways that um, we might rely on some of his expertise. Had a realignment call with CSAC, um, conference call, and I think uh, Gary, you might you were on that call as well. So now that the legislation has passed, the enabling legislation, Tom, you're going to speak on AB 109 uh, for that portion of it. But uh, we're just, uh, I won't say arguing over the numbers, but trying to understand the numbers to make sure that there is enough there and keeping our eye on the rural counties and the smallest communities to make sure we get our fair share. Um, then uh, I had a call that I'm Bill Renfro in the audience going to talk with you about. Uh, Connie Stewart gives a call regarding some new monies that are available for planning grants for broadband. And while we are going out 199 for redundancy, we need to start looking at some other opportunities. And obviously what pops to mind is connecting Crescent City with the south end of the county, which is Klamath. And so we're going to be looking at that, and there should be some money coming our way. And other than that, um, I took the opportunity this weekend. I had my daughter, Caitlin. I took her and her older brother, and we went down to a giant game Saturday night, and then we went to the game Sunday. I had a wonderful time with the family. Um, perspective is different. Some of us go to see the games, depending on who's pitching. My daughter wanted to go Friday because it was country western night, and she got a belt buckle. And uh, then Sunday was fedora hat day, so it's what they give away. <laughs> but anyway, had a great time with the family. had uh, some special meetings. I was, uh, after our meeting on Tuesday, I left for the, my second round of Coastal Commission meetings, and um, that was down in San Rafael, and that went quite well, and we are going to, for the first time in the history of Del Norte County, in September, the Coastal Commission will meet here, which is a great thing, I think. Great news. That they're, you know, because I really had to preface some of the commissioners on you're going to get to see what we talk about in relationship to rural California and in relationship to rural coastal California because it's dramatically different than Huntington Beach or you know, all land south. So I'm excited for that. And so I'm going to start the preparation and working on that and figuring out all the ins and outs of that. I met, um, the senior board met, they're working on um, still getting legs back under them, but it looks like things are going well and it, it's gonna be okay. Historical Society is on its way to raising the money for its match on the lighthouse and we too have our um, visitors are up at the, at the lighthouse, so that's a good thing. Um, solid Waste we met 
and the ad, ad hoc committee of solid waste meets again today to make sure that everything in the franchise rollout has been um, adequate. I, um, on my way back from San Rafael, I had the opportunity to stop in and visit with Carol Hart. And Carol Hart is the um, recreation director for Sonoma County, but more importantly, she is the chair of the State Parks Commission. And so we were able to talk a bit about what closures mean and how that impacts and any ideas of what we could do. Um, it, it appears that the Mill Creek here is going to, the campground is going to remain open. Um, but there's some things that every park has an association with it, which is the, like here, I'm part of the Redwood Park Association, which is a private nonprofit that with the as assistance of possibly some bigger foundations, any kind of threatened park closure could be addressed through those nonprofits. So that looks pretty promising. So that was a, that was a good, uh, a good uh, attempt to try to get some movement there. Um, I've been following closely the redistricting maps and um, those came out yesterday, I think, the, what's probably the final final which puts us with the coastal communities uh, moving north and south for both our Senate district, our assembly district. And we will now, I think it's gonna be the second congressional district, um, which will be an open seat. So we will have, um, we've really lost one pure congressional representative from the California coast, but with Thompson still being reaching to Santa Rosa, some of those coastal impacts will still reach and with Garamendi being close, that's another coastal impact person. And then with the new person from our district, so we may have actually, can actually see some strengthening of our congressional representative there. And Garamendi, he's always just a phone call away for people, so he's a really good source of support for us. I also um, reviewed the um, front street design that the city has put forward. And I was really impressed with the solutions that they came up with, especially the parking area. So when kids are down there getting in and out of cars on soccer days, they're not getting right out on the street. It's, on, it's a more controlled parking area. So that looks really promising. And a roundabout at, uh, um, at, at the A Street end, or right in there. So that's kind of exciting. Um, I, um, when I came back, I've, instead of going somewhere for vacation, I went to uh, camp at Jed, which is my favorite place in the world to go camping. I participated in a couple of forest walks and um, also went down to Klamath to see the whale and I was absolutely amazed that the only, there was one little handmade paper sign coming from the Klamath side that said, slow down. And it was partially ripped. There was no warning stuff. I don't know if that should have been Caltrans responsibility or if it should have been the counties or the tribes, but it was pretty frightening to see a couple hundred people on the bridge and nobody, no calming of traffic. Um, mm -hmm. Coming from the um, south, there was a working sign that said pedestrians or something, but it or people on bridge or something. But it was, uh, it was kind of a touch and go place because people get so excited they're not paying attention. Um, so I don't know if, if the whale is still there, we should probably, I think the mother's still there and we should make sure something happens. Well, I think it already has. I think I was down there Friday with my daughter I was and looked at it. The CHPs were, there was two of them. They were going back, calming the traffic at about five, 10 miles an hour for a good couple hours when I was down there. On the day I was there, of course, yeah. it was overcast, and maybe they thought there weren't going to be as many people. So, but it's and, CHP. And my last part is that if any of you have had the opportunity to participate in community-supported agriculture with Ocean Air Farms, it's an absolute wonderful program of local fresh produce being produced that you get a box once a week, and it's just, it's, it's a really neat way to support local farmers and local ag and get some great stuff. So I hope people look at that and of course go to the farmer's market because that is kind of a party atmosphere where everybody's getting good stuff to eat. So that, that's about it. Oh, and Jerry Mello, I'm sorry. Jerry Mello and Mary from League of Cities and with the assistance of RCRC, 
that's such an important conversation because the conversation is not a conversation of let's get rid of the Coastal Commission. The conversation is how can we make the Coastal Commission's process more user friendly? How can we make it more understandable? How can we get our LCPs approved? How can we, you know, it's, it's that kind of conversation, which is my focus as a commissioner, is how can we make this a, um, a, a state agency or commission that isn't onerous, but is a partner with communities. So I think that that discussion is gonna go up and down the state, and I'm gonna try to keep promoting that discussion with the commissioners myself, because that's the direction we need to go. That's it. Thank you. Well, I had a gender review. I also um, received a phone call from Jeff Bonke regarding the, uh, the lease or agreement with Alexander's, and I'm hoping we'll hear more about that later. I also met in the special, um, pardon me, special closed session um, for the board last Tuesday. Uh, Supervisor McClure mentioned her ad hoc committee for solid waste. Well, the other solid waste ad hoc committee uh, met, um, and then we met with uh, Kevin Hendrick, our director. Um, I'd like to apologize to Supervisor Sullivan for not being able to grant his request for having the report on the last agenda or this one between two people's health problems and vacation and um, we did get it done. It will be on the next agenda and it's reduced from 19 pages to three. So everybody should appreciate that also. Um, I had an air quality meeting in Eureka. Um, it was a short meeting, just general business. Um, update on, we have a new air monitoring system that is up and running now on Humboldt Hill. And my understanding is this is portable. So if there was like a forest fire or some, some hazardous event, that this could be moved to monitor air. Um, the only thing that bothered me at the end of the meeting, there was a short, just a little statement that some regs are coming down the pike that really have me worried. And it is going to be addressing the dust, the particulate matter coming from farmlands, from, from agriculture. And I just felt like, you know, we've been regulated out of fishing, we've been regulated out of the timber industry, and now they're gonna go after our ag, you know, we will be importing our fruits and vegetables, folks, from other countries if, if somebody doesn't back off or speak up. I, I don't want air pollution any more than the next guy, but you know, I know a heck of a lot of old, old farmers uh, that have been breathing that, that dirt and dust for years and years, and I just think we're getting a little carried away. Anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. <laughs> um, Luckily, our air quality um, management district escaped a $140,000 cut from the state budget. We uh, were very pleased that, that that didn't happen to us there. Uh, I also wanted to mention Supervisor Yeagle, who sits on the air quality management district um, commission with me from Trinity County, mentioned that the mill that burnt uh, during the forest fires in 2008 has been rebuilt and retooled, and they have received um, a $250,000 grant to um, start being able to take care of biomass and um, Supervisor Yeagle was pleased that we are finally getting some acknowledgement uh, of the impact to our air quality from the forest fires because we are not taking care of those ladder fuels properly. We just don't have good enough management yet. And Ted did laugh go, and Supervisor McClure had mentioned that, um, talking about the state parks and, and hoping we don't have any closures. At the end of our meeting yesterday, one of the, the alternates that sat in said that she had heard that Jed Smith State Park was going to be closing next year. And I thought, if that's true, I doubt that they would be applying to Big Rock Water District for service 
um, next year. That was good news to me that um, with Big Rock applying for for um, water through the to um, or not Big Rock, but Jed Smith applying for water through the Big Rock Water District sounded pretty promising. So they're not on the list. Did be closed down? I didn't think so. They couldn't do that to us, could they? <laughs> Anyway, that is that is about it. Thank you. I'm sure. I, I forgot. There's two. I, I did have a call with uh, Ruth Coleman uh, prior to going on vacation in uh, regards to uh, Alexander grazing on Tolliver Dunes and the fact that there's a lawsuit now. And at this point, they're looking at revoking the permit for continued grazing. Yes. Um, and hopefully, more will, will come with that because um, it's it's frustrating that all, all that has to happen is environmental group sues somebody and and the suit and is, hasn't been filed yet no, it's a threat of a suit the threat of the suit yeah we, um, I did hear also just to reaffirm with every other supervisors Mill Creek is not getting closed down they they they're gonna keep that open National Park is gonna step in uh, the other thing which is encouraging and we just need the other partner to step forward is uh, Ruth had mentioned that uh, State Parks is very much still in favor of setting up some type of uh, State Park <laughs> Academy at College of the Redwoods Del Norte. Um, the problem we have thus far, State Park, and, and I know all of her top personnel are on board with this, I've had a couple meetings with them, um, is where is College of the Redwoods? And that has been one of the most frustrating things, and I know they've gone through change up in the president and stuff, and, um, but it seems to become a lot of lip service coming out of College of Redwood and very little action. Um, especially when I'm hearing state parks is already I've met with uh, with their top people and they want to get going about getting some people locally trained um, uh, just for the public's information a, a ranger position only requires an AA or an AS does not require a bachelor's degree so a two-year you could through College of the Redwoods it starts at forty two thousand dollars a year um, forty two thousand dollars in Crest City is a living wage um, and the problem they're finding within the parks, and this is per Director Coleman, they cannot find um, young people coming out of college that want to move to remote areas anymore. That used to be 34 years ago. They wanted to, that was part of the culture, and wanted to, to go out into, uh, you know, the pristine areas. Most of the, new, the, the younger kids now want to go near metropolitan areas and urban areas. Um, so if you could get locally kids kids trained here to work for the state parks here, uh, one is they could stay, but they could also, a kid from Del Norte is more likely to relocate to Siskiyou or Trinity County to work than them trying to get somebody out of the Bay Area or Los Angeles to go there. So it's a win-win across the board. We just need College of the Redwoods to step up to the plate. Um, and uh, that's, anyway, uh, also on the agriculture, I got a call from a couple of bulb growers this morning. And, they're very concerned about the future setbacks next year on the regulations, and um, I think some of it has to do with daycare facilities also. Um, that wasn't mentioned. But. Anyway, it's something I know we passed a right to farm ordinance, um, and we really ought to take a look and see what we can do on the local side to maybe tweak that ordinance to continue to to allow people to uh, to farm for, for ag uses. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's a vital part of the community, and it is a very important part of the economy um, and we of all people need that to stay in place so anyway those are my two side thank you there. members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board if you are addressing the board regarding matter on the agenda you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter please limit your comments to three minutes or less Do we have any public comment at this time Seeing none, we will move right into our 1030 item, and that is to conduct a public hearing, waive full reading, read by title only, and adopt an ordinance amending chapter 2.04, sections 2.04.021 through 20.04.025 of the Delaware County Code establishing supervisorial districts as requested by the county clerk portal. At this time, I will open the public hearing. And who is addressing this? Alyssa. I didn't see anybody moving. <laughs> so this is basically the last step in the local redistricting process. Um, every 10 years following the federal census, uh, each county is called upon to redistrict, redistrict the five supervisorial districts. Um, 
and based upon the 2010 census data, uh, the board is required to approve the redistricting before the end of the 2011 year. Um, so ours was fairly simple. We are not going to have any changes. Um, the maps have been drawn and submitted, which there were no changes, but they were updated. Um, the public hearings, as required, have been held. This is the final one. And all that really is left is approval from the board, and we will be basically finished. Thank you, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Move to approve. Second. I, I have a motion and a second, yeah, but I would also second. like to ask for public comments. Any public comment regarding this matter? Hearing none, I will close the the public hearing. And now I have a motion and a second. Jeremy, would you call the vote, please? Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor McNamer? Yes. Okay, we're just a couple of minutes early for the 1035 presentation. something quick we could take in here. All right. Um, we'll consider approving the consent agenda. You move to approve. Well, I'm going to let somebody else because I had a question on one. Oh. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion. We don't have a second for the consent. Well, I've got a conflict. I've got a conflict, so I can't second. You both have conflicts? You can second. I guess I can second it. I have a motion and a second. Um, discussion from the board. You had a question on one of them? Well, I had a question. I'm just going to abstain on one just for appearance's sake because it was questioned because I used the services of one of the people that I might have unduly influenced her. Oh. So just so. to cover my behind in front of the judge, I'm going to abstain. Okay. Yeah, so no, 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 it's just one. I'll do it when we vote. Oh, I was going to say, I need to make sure it's not the same thing that they're it abstaining from, so we don't, okay. I want to make sure we're going to have enough to vote on it. Okay. So, Jeremy, oh, any public comment on the consent agenda? I mean, none, Jeremy, follow up. I did have one question on item number nine with the uh, the use of the old mental health building. Mm -hmm. Are they just using that for storage? Or are they going to use that for personnel? Didn't we have a problem with personnel being in there? Originally, yes, when there was the roof collapse, but it was part of that correction was to clean up the asbestos and deal with all of the hazardous materials, which it was. Re-roofed, yeah, there would be personnel in there, some offices, and then also training areas. Um, it is a space that uh, they can all their own at this point. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, Jeremy, all vote, please. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes, abstaining on 21. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes, abstaining on number six, because I wasn't here at the meeting. Uh, conflict of interest on 11, uh, 30. That's it. That's it. Supervisor Hemmingson? Uh, yes, I need to recuse myself on item number 30. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor McNamer? Yes, on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are ready for uh, our presentation by our Chief Probation Officer, Tom Crow. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair, we'll sit over here on the side. <laughs> do, you, do I care if you sit over there? Absolutely well, not. Good, because <laughs> I don't want to stand in. Uh, yeah, that's too hard to look straight up. Well, good morning. <clears throat> I'm here to discuss the public safety portion of realignment. Um, that's covered in AB 109 and AB 117, and hopefully you shed some insight on the local impact of that. If I can get this to work. Oh, 
Okay, there we go. Okay, so generally speaking, October 1st, certain uh, state prison inmates who have been designated low risk offenders will be released to Delnark County and they will be released to the community, not to jails. So they will come straight from state prison to the community. Um, the projected number is to be 26 over a two year period and it averages about two per month coming in. Um, some months there's three, other months there's zero and it just kind of staggers, but it, it averages out about two per month. Um, in addition to that, new offenses, um, which offenses are, they're non-violent, non-serious, non-sexual, which we refer to as non-non-non, so you'll hear non-non-nons a lot, will not be eligible for state prison commitment and will need to be sanctioned locally. So if they're sentenced to be incarcerated, they'll have to do it in the jail instead of prison. Um, and also, in addition, that population would be eligible for post-release community supervision, which is another term that you'll hear quite often. It's kind of awkward, but the PCRS group. And so basically that's kind of would be a, a, parole, a parole locally would be about the best way to look at that. Current parolees supervised the state will be remain on state parole until their term is completed. Confinement sanctions for current parolees will require, re require local jail commitment. Um, so the, the folks that are on state parole, if they have a revocation or if they have to be sanctioned, they will go to the local jail instead of state prison. The state has uh, allocated limited funding to cover the planning and implementation of a local plan to address the realignment process and it's very limited funding. So options for the non-non-nons at sentencing, jail instead of prison for the same period of time. So this means that if a crime was good for three years, technically they could be sentenced to the local county jail for three years. Um, they do receive day for day credit, which is so they would serve half that time, but that's a substantial amount of time in a local jail. So Tom, will they go to the local judge basically to determine whether they did the same period of time? Is that how it works? Yes, okay. the, the courts will, um, individually, based on case-by-case -case basis, come up with whatever um, uh, sanction is going to be for whatever crime. So they, they may sentence there, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but um, there's several different options for sentencing for the so courts. So are they going to be needing to be appointed a public defender in that case, too? Yes. No, actually, um, this group, they're coming in. It's a fresh crime, so it'll be just like any other process. Follow the, the typical court process. These are new crimes. Um, that were they're non non nons. So, so it's somebody that's never been in trouble. They commit a new offense out there. If it fits this criteria, it'll follow the same court process as any other crime. Excuse me, Tom. Prior, yes. prior to this, um, anything over one year previously was prison, right? With some exceptions, there's some waivers that you could do uh, additional time. But that's basically the concept: is that local county time is one year and then beyond that would have been state prison. Um, so other options for the non-non-nons at sentencing, uh, felony probation, so they can still, just like we do now, put them on felony probation with some jail time. Um, jail, early release to alternative custody, which would be home detention or electronic monitoring, several different options there for sentencing. And uh, split sentence would be jail um, with mandatory probation. Um, so kind of, if you can follow this chart, so these are folks that, like I said again, um, have committed a new offense. Um, but they do fall in the non-non-non category. So they're not a serious, violent, or serious sexual crime. Those folks are still eligible for prison. So this is the, the broad group of folks, the majority of our crimes um, would fit this flow chart. And so if you go to the left of it, um, the local options at sentencing, um, jail, jail and probation, alternatives, other basically um, there's a lot of latitude there uh, for the courts to, to provide sentencing for this group. Um, and so if you travel to the right of the flowchart, um, jail and complete sentence and release, they can be sentenced for straight time and with no um, supervision afterwards. So they could be sentenced to three years technically or even in some cases more, um, county jail, receive the credit and then get out and with no supervision at the end. Um, that's one option. The sheriff can um, early release alternative incarceration programs. Um, so there's 
there's several different options there that um, the community corrections partnership will pursue and see what fits our um, jurisdiction uh, sheriff early release program for jail management and they there's no limitation on the sheriff's ability to still release because of constitutional population guidelines so i mean you know the, there's no infringement on the sheriff's authority once they're in the jail um, also alternative programs and treatment which again the, the community corrections partnership will be looking at different options um, to try to not send everybody to jail all the time so that's the ultimate goal here is to really try to be innovative and pursue different ways and to approach this this process which is is just really not sustainable at this point options for the non non ons after sentencing um, enhanced local custody and supervision tools uh, again like i said alternative custody tools for jail there's work programs different electronic monitoring codes have been added um, so the sheriff has some latitude there probation can assist with that home detention for low-level offenders and intensive probation supervision um, so the non 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 category they can be given some supervision after they serve their time if that's what the sentence is and part of that could be intensive probation supervision uh, the counties may still contract for beds they, we don't know what the costs of that are but that I would estimate would be quite expensive and um, it depends also I think on the type of offender uh, if they have severe needs um, I'm sure that the rate would be more we don't know I've talked with the sheriff about this and and they really have not established what that would look like can be quite certain it would be expensive state parole jurisdiction okay these are the folks that would remain on state parole uh, third strikes so these are lifers who have done their time and they're out on parole now individuals with a current violent serious or um, serious sexual offense uh, high-risk sex offenders and the MDOs mentally disordered offenders and anybody that's on parole up until October 1st currently even if they fit that low risk category would still stay with state parole the local pr planning process um, the community corrections partnership uh, will have to submit a local plan to the board and once we figure out all of the different alternatives and, and different uh, we're really going to try to be innovative we've met informally um, the meetings are now subject to the Brown Act it's been determined so hopefully I'll be meeting with County Council and uh, kind of going over some ins and out a lot of the counties are recommending that um, the, the group meets with the County Council and kind of review the Brown Act but the composition the chief probation officer is the chair sheriff the police chief district attorney public defender judge or designee director of health and human services designee of the board of supervisors employment representative head of county office of education victims representative and a community-based organization with experience really rehabilitating criminal offenders most of these folks have been chosen and there's a couple of them we have uh, still are looking at the CBO slot and an employment representative so I'm still pursuing that the executive committee uh, the chief probation officer sheriff police chief the DA the public defender um, the judge or designee and the director of the health and human services will determine the final plan and submit it to the Board of Supervisors uh, so the entire group will work on the plan and then we'll this group the executive committee votes on it and uh, for final determination to submit to the board the post-release community supervision uh, I have to apologize for this the dates coming up on us very quickly uh, the Board of Supervisors designate the county agency responsible to supervise post-release community supervision and inform CDCR by August 1st and this is a little inaccurate it does say I wrote on here the Board of Supervisors but basically the county does and I don't believe it's as formal as a resolution and we just need to notify CDCR and the purpose of that is so that they can start sending packets um, to that agency as quickly as possible so that we can start planning how we're going to supervise these folks now I have talked with the sheriff and the majority of the um, members of the community corrections partnership and uh, the recommendation will be that probation be the designated agency so that would that's the recommendation to the board at this time uh, post-release community supervision um, 
super le supervision levels, the case plan, sanctions determined by the supervision agency. Uh, part of that, probation would use evidence-based practices, which a big part of it is a validated risk assessment tool. So when the folks come in, we can run a, it's an evidence-based tool. It's a pretty in-depth and it's uh, quite inclusive and it will risk, provide a risk level of these folks and we can know where they are. And then we do that periodically and determine how they're progressing. So that's, a, that's an approach that just about every county is following throughout the state. Uh, cognitive behavioral groups, we've started those groups and the first ones we've started out with the, some easier folks to get going and uh, they're working well. And so as we progress, uh, the risk assessment tool will identify what type of group the offender needs to be in. So there's several different domains of uh, groups. And uh, basically, these groups consist of a facilitator <coughs> and journaling and interactive uh, kind of role and acting throughout the process. So um, the learning process um, is greatly enhanced by acting and role modeling and stuff like that. So the, the groups are kind of, they're really interesting. The probation officers have, uh, the adult probation officers have all been trained to facilitate those meetings. Motivational interviewing is a process that uh, really kind of reviews how we interview folks and um, it's quite impressive. It doesn't sound like much when you first start into it, but as you progress in it, it really pulls information out that's, va that's critical for the risk assessment tool. And so instead of just asking closed in questions, there's a complete process you go through, which is quite, um, quite elaborate. And uh, basically you're, you're getting the really good information for this tool so it can be accurate. And intensive supervision, um, again, is in the field, um, checking daily or as needed um, for the folks that will need to be supervised. And alternative sanctions, there's home detention, electronic monitoring, um, a lot of different options out there for us to pursue and day reporting so the group again will review many different options and come up with the, the best that we can for our jurisdiction uh, flash incarceration uh, the supervising agency can uh, immediately take into custody anybody who um, violates a, a term of their release up to 10 days so that's without involving the court process which saves a lot of money a lot of time don't have to get everybody involved. And we can, you know. Again, though, you're in the jail, and that's costly as well. So we're looking for alternatives, uh, but that option is there and m most certainly will be utilized. Uh, the administrative process process is significantly narrows the court's involvement to only the final revocation process. And what that means is that if you've used every sanction up until um, the 10 day um, flash incarcerations are no longer effective then uh, the final revocation would be up to 180 days and that would have to be done by the courts. So hopefully area, problem areas can be addressed, you know, not leading up to that. Uh, the supervising agency will have the authority to handle all intermediate sanctions without court involvement up to and including the flash incarceration. Post-release community supervision discharge. So these, guys, these folks, um, at the end of three years, no matter what, they're off supervision. Six months with no violations, there's an option to release them, but it's not mandatory. You must discharge after a continuous year with no violations. So if they haven't done anything for a year, you have to discharge them from supervision. And the courts will not be involved in the discharge process. So kind of the, where we're at is that uh, the county needs to uh, notify CDCR of the agency that will be chosen uh, for the post-community supervision, post-release community supervision. Uh, the Community Corrections Partnership will continue to work with the local plan to address realignment strategies. Uh, like I said, this group um, is pretty much put together and folks are working very well together and I think that uh, we'll come up with some very innovative approaches. A local plan to be completed and approved by the Board of Supervisors as close to October 1st as possible. So that's the date that this all starts, so it would behoove us to have a plan in place. Uh, most counties will not have it done by October 1st, and most likely this will be a constantly evolving process where 
as we learn what we're dealing with, we'll be amending and kind of adjusting as we proceed. Uh, we will have something put together for the board to kind of give the direction and uh, where we're heading with this. But I, again, I think that it's important that we continue to review the process and see what's effective and what works for, for us locally. Um, the intention uh, of this group is that we really kind of monitor the impact across the services of each individual. So we have a couple coming in a month. We can track this. And these folks are people from our community. We've already sent them to prison. They're from Dunlark County. We know them, so we have the, you know information. We already, a lot of the work and some, oftentimes is done. And some of them were on probation. We have a lot of background. Um, so we will just be working, um, kind of monitoring to see how it impacts social services or the jails and, you know, and what the needs are so that in, as years progress that we'll be able to allocate resources to best meet the need there. So the overarching goals, improve public safety with accountability and better outcomes for the felony offenders and sustainable public safety policy. Um, where we're at is that basically incarceration is bankrupting the state. And if we pursue that same line locally, it'll bankrupt us. It's just, you know, folks with medical issues and the needs that can happen, things that happen while you're incarcerated, that's all pretty much general fun. So uh, our goal is to really work on alternative sanctions without skipping the accountability. So it's going to be a difficult balance, uh, but we'll work together. It's a good group on the Community Corrections Partnership. And I, any questions that any of you have? Also, I do have uh, late last week the three associations, the Probation Association, Sheriff's Association, and CSAC finally got together and put together a summary that they all, all have agreed on. There's been a lot of different opinions and interpretations yeah. of the, both of these bills. Um, so, Madam Chair, if, if I can give these to you. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Tom, any, any idea of where the funding's coming from? Funding's coming from the state. It'll be deposited into a fund that we create here locally. Um, it's not a lot of money. And so the, the cautious approach is to really stand by, sit on the funding as long as we can and see where the need's gonna be. Uh, the sheriff, he could very well end up with somebody in the jail that he cannot maintain in there and would have to contract with the state to send them off. We just don't know. So the, the I think the, the direction would be is to go slow and work very closely with these folks. Um, starting off, you know, the ones coming from prison, a couple of months, we can, we can absorb that in the probation caseload. And so we'll work with them intensively and, and kind of see where it's going, but we really just don't know. So the good part of this is that two years ago, um, under S Senate Bill 678, probation was provided funding to start the process of providing um, evidence-based practices and different approaches to offenders, and it just kind of dovetailed right into this, and I'm sure that they knew that that was coming before anybody else did, but, uh, but so there, that's the kind of the, the point would be is to sit on the funding and, you know, see where it's needed and really measure the impact on the various agencies that the offenders kind of intersect with. So maybe it's a CSAC question about uh, where we're at. So is it VLF or what, what is the source of funding? No, it's general fund. Yeah. That's coming out of our pocket. You bet. No, this, the funding for this basically came out of CDCR's state. budget. Oh, the state general fund. Yeah. It's, it's a shift of funds that were already there. Mm -hmm. and it's just a guaranteed funding stream with the thought that, number one, the counties know these people better. They can do it cheaper and better. And you can address what is it that you can do for those people in your community that can keep them from reoffending. So where the attitude used to be, if we got a problem, we're going to dump it to the state and let them worry about it, and it was your tax dollars paying for it. Now it's still your tax dollars paying for it, but you're going to have to do a better job of it, so it'll cost you less. But in addition, you know, the folks that we've sent off to prison, they're coming back home. So, right. I mean, they're in the old model. One way or the other. But we wouldn't have anything to say about Right. You don't program. have anything to say about it, and they come back, and oftentimes they're a lot harder than when we sent them. And so... 
the folks, you know, the majority of these folks that we were sending to prison are coming back to our community. So, you know, this might be the opportunity to hop on it and see what we can do to, to try to, to The to concept change. is good. The money in the beginning will be okay. And it's up to us to make sure that it works. Yeah. Well, the concern that, that I would have is that we contract with the state and if there's a, an offender that we can't control and we have to contract back with the state and pay them back more money than what they're paying us for that person to begin yeah, with? Very well could That's happen. That's a good question. Um, yeah. I, I would be really concerned with that. The other concern that I would have would be medical issues, which can get very expensive. Um, so those are, you know, some of the reasons to have alternative process, you know, with yeah. electronic monitoring and intensive supervision. And there's a lot of things you can do for folks other than locking them up. Um, so the, the issue, though, that I think it's important to state is that the option for the sheriff to be able to deal with the offender um, that comes in that really he cannot manage in that facility has to remain on the table, even though it would probably be the last resort. Um, I think it's imperative that we don't rule that out. And, you know, having a juvenile hall under my, my control, I can tell you that there's sometimes you get folks in there and this just, it stretches you you know, beyond really where you should be. And so, um, although that's a, probably a very expensive option, um, it needs to be left on the table for the sheriff to determine that. Um, today in the newspaper, there was a two column wide, three quarter page of all the news of record. And in there, there were several people that were sent to state prison. And there was one that was sent to prison for being a habitual drunk driver. And then there was another one that was a home burglary, I guess, a robbery. I don't know what it, what it exactly was. And I think that there might have been one other in there also. Would those three, would those two have been sent to prison, sent to county, sent, what, what would have happened? Well, this, I can tell you this, and working within this system almost 15 years, this court is very cautious about who they do send to, pri send to prison in the first place. And so when, um, the folks that they're sending to prison pretty much need to go to prison and you know it's uh, you know the habitual drunk driver there's a big story behind that case and all these other cases um, but, but it's would reflected that, would that yeah. fall into a non 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 I think it would fall into a serious depending on how many drunk driving priors it's you know and then if there's an injury and the amount of injury to the right. other folks I mean it gets it turns into a serious crime um, the issue um, is really reflected in the fact that we only have 24 folks coming back. Um, you know, really, there are some small counties that are going to be overwhelmed with the number of offenders coming back to their jurisdiction because their courts were sentencing everybody to prison. I mean, you know, some of these non non nons were always going. And I talked with those chiefs, and, you know, here come the, uh, the parolees back to them. And, you know, that's kind of the, there's funding associated with that, but the funding is not near enough if you have to start hiring staff. And so, with the number of offenders some of these counties are receiving back, they're hiring staff. And that is very expensive. So, so funding, you'll still partner with the, with the court to determine that non-non-non status? It's basically, the non-non-non status is established by statute. So, you know, it, it depends on the nature of the crime, what the district attorney ends up, um, if it's a plea so bargain. Is a house burglary a non-non-non? <clears throat> no, first degree burglary is a very serious offense. Or robbery. What, what's yeah. the difference? So they went into robbery or house. first degree burglary would be very, very serious. Um, and those are the only felony ones, right? No, you could have a second degree burglary, which would be a felony. Um, there's okay, ones so that would, would that fit person, in a non- Would non that person- <coughs> Currently, typically not go to prison. Okay. A first degree burglary is very serious, you know, if it's ever happened to anybody. Um, it's you can shoot somebody if they're in your house uh, and kill them so it's a very serious offense and the threat that it poses to the occupants um, residential burglary is a very serious offense so um, it's, I'm just trying to get a feel of what would be what would be a trigger well there's a list it's, there's, it's codified there's a list of what those basically offenses are. the penal code section to the penal code the okay. penal code section determines what's a serious what's violent and then there are some exceptions to that the list is up to about 60 plus now of crimes that really would be non non nons but because of various interest groups they're still eligible for prison so that list started out at about 44 and it's grown to 60 plus um, there's some very bizarre ones on there i have that list uh, but various interest groups have 
have had input and they've determined that these, even though they're kind of a non to non status, still should be prison eligible. But, but not are, necessarily required. Not required, correct. And so the, um, I really think that, you know, compared to other counties of our size, we're in a really good, really good sp spot with this because our courts have been judicious and, and who they do send to prison. And, and you know, I can tell you when somebody goes to prison from Delaware County, they need to go to prison. That's my opinion. So, I mean, we try to work with folks and work with them and um, there's some very serious things. And when you read the newspaper, it really doesn't give the full story. No. So, yeah. Um, Any other questions from the board? Any the summary questions? that I did give you really goes into detail and I think that you'll find it very informative. Okay. So, Thanks, Tom. Are we, Thanks, just, Tom. Are we just gonna ask, it's not an action item on our agenda, but we could, could we ask the chair to designate the direct staff to designate the county probation officer as the post-release community supervisor agency? Probation department. Probation I think department. you could. Um, so it didn't say action item. It's not an action item at this point. Um, essentially, the way it's, it's designed and set up, probation, uh, Tom is the chair of that committee. It's all designed to go to probation at this point. So I think you could endorse that. But do you need that endorsement in order to have? We bas basically what the statute says or what the determination at this point is that the county will notify CDCR. It doesn't uh, state the board of supervisors. So if the board endorsed it, we would follow it up with a letter. I'm, I'm well, and at the, are we able to do that today? Has to be by August one. Yes, because we don't have. It'd be fine if you just endorsed it. Which would mean that we should direct staff to. Okay. You well, are so directed. Right. right. You know the other question I had then it said October so first was the deadline. Are we going to get We're some so endorsed. advanced idea of what you guys are going to do besides a week? You'll know around October first, kind of the. The beginning of a plan if not a you know a good start off on a plan so so the um, answer is no huh? uh, the answer is no we're not going to get any advance notice more than a you week. absolutely I will come back in here and discuss anything that uh, yeah, if we could do something by you know maybe the first meeting in September would be sure you have an outline of we can we, we kind of have some directions that we're looking at and I've worked with the sheriff and various members of the partnership and so I think we can put together just a basic you know direction for you I think the specifics will will take time and again we don't really know what we're looking at so we're kind of working in the dark um, we have an idea but we just you know it's kind of new so we so we'll proceed and evolve as we go but I definitely supervise Sullivan will have something for you okay I think part of the real value of the board is weighing in on what those programs are evidence-based albeit uh, that we feel that this community ranks as a priority. We've done some of that work in the health and safe and healthy families and, and Tom, you've done some of that work. So I think it's validating some of those and prioritizing where the dollars are gonna go once it gets brought forward. Thank you for your presentation, Tom. Do we have any comments from the public regarding this presentation? Okay. Now we have a lot of budget transfers. Must be the end of the year. You can tell it's the end of the year. Move to approve budget transfers 06, 05, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 22, and 23 as provided in the agenda items number 32 through 44. Uh, what, what about 19, oh, yes, 20, and 21? It's in that. They're it's all in, in uh, 42. Well, Where? yes, those 40. two. <laughs> oh. 19 and 20 uh, yeah. and 21 under item 42 as well yes. as 18. As the chair mentioned, this is year end cleanup. Yes. Second. I have a motion and a second. What do you all about? Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Supervisor Finnegan? Yes. Supervisor McNamer? Yes. We have any public comment on budget transfers? 
I didn't think so. Well, actually, you know, most of them are pretty minor, other than that one of the health insurance budget, which is a right. different little shifting of funds. But um, the others, not bad job by the department heads. In fact, good job. Number 45, legislative and budget issues. Jim. Uh, there have been a few actions taken since the governor approved the budget. Um, one of the more significant ones for Delmar County was that there is a legal challenge to the fee of $150 to those properties that are located within the state responsibility areas and have structures on those. Um, there have been a, a lot of different opinions in regards to that fee, but that does take up a considerable amount of Delmar County where Supervisor Hemmingson and I were looking at some of the maps a week or so ago. Uh, essentially, at the intersection of Old Mill Road is where the state responsibility area starts as you go north until you get to Smith River. And there's a lot of homes, a lot of structures. Um, obviously, this is more for wildland fires when you're in a state responsibility area. And we certainly have areas that the state CDF is responsible for, and they do an excellent job at, at assisting. Big Flat is predominantly one of our one of our areas that's remote and requires some assistance from CDF to say the least if something was to start up there. But a lot of these other homes or structures are down in the flat areas. Uh, the responsibility areas are set by the state. They're also completely uh, within local volunteer fire protection districts. And I know they work well together. But this will be an interesting. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. In, prevails. This is another $150. I did have a conversation with Mr. Mattingly out of Klamath. And Klamath is attempting to increase their local stipend to, for, for fire protection. They've, had, they've struggled for years with money. And this is one of the, an issue that will come up that will probably be a significant hurdle for them to get over as they go through their process. Not to say they won't be successful, but you add $150 on the tax bill along with local one and it gets to be burdensome. So there are others that are going through the process. There's always legislation, but that one st struck me as being one of the more significant ones for Delmar County. Well. That's it? Um, I think 46 was pulled and yes. I would ask for Supervisor McClure's assistance in setting up a meeting with Karen here. So going back to your state responsibility areas, just for those people who are going to pick this up on the TV, there is no mechanism to implement that at this present time. And there's going to, it's going to be challenged through legislation, um, even though it was signed by the governor. Um, so it really is in limbo. Cal Fire doesn't know how to justify it or how to implement it. Local tax collectors don't know how to do it. Who's going to pay for it? So yet to be seen how, what's so going to happen. So it's there, it's just not going to happen. Very likely, yeah. And, you know, it's not to uh, diminish the importance of CAL FIRE locally. Right. They are of great assistance to Delmar County and these individual fire departments. Uh, they obviously are, they staff a, a station down in Klamath, and they have bailed out Klamath Fire, or assisted with Klamath Fire when, during their times of transition. Uh, they've always been there to assist us. Uh, they've had some excellent battalion chiefs. I know that one of our he just retired. Uh, you know, Chief Brooks was uh, always available to assist us. So, yeah, the uh, the mechanism to fund them is what they're they're after at this point. Yeah, this is this will be an interest. Well, and I do agree. Probably 95 percent of the fires, our first responders are local. So, I, I'd be upset if I had to pay that 150 dollars. For Cal Fire. Uh, the maps are interesting. You can go online and look at the state responsibility area maps and see what the local responsibility areas are. The you know, Crescent City is is uh, in a local responsibility area until you get out on North Crest Drive a little bit. The Birch Tract is in, but almost everything surrounding that is a state responsibility area. The town of Smith River and all of the outlying um, ag fields are pretty much local responsibility areas. But if you move across the highway, you're in a state responsibility area. So there's, uh, you know, it, it's all about wildland urban interface, and there are needs out there. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But it is a considerable area to Delmar County. It's going to affect a lot of them. 
Okay, item, or excuse me, do we have any public comment on that item? Seeing none, we'll move to capital projects. Jay, do you have anything on capital projects? Uh, we're still wrapping up uh, Lawrence Keller and Ruby Van Dieven Parks. We've received the uh, Pikes Fields final payment. Uh, they still are holding back uh, 10%, but uh, that happens when we're going through this process. We have some uh, things that we need to discuss with the state. State Parks regarding Florence Keller and Ruby Van Dievenger. Um, we should be finishing those up over the next month or two. Um, asking for final billing. Uh, Battery Point is we're still getting the final specifications done so that we can go out. It's been a little more complicated than first thought because of the, uh, I think I mentioned last time, lightning, lightning sus uh, suppression system. Permitting, uh, CDD has been assisting with some uh, liaison work with the Coastal Commission to get these uh, out of Eureka, in this case, uh, to make these de minimis so that we can get these exempted, and that's been successful. Uh, the town site project is underway. There's an excavator down there, and we also have a whale down there. And so we're on, on call at any given time if the whale comes into the area on our way out we would, could possibly have to shut down for that period of time so as to not discourage her to stay up in the river. Um, our biologists and our construction managers and our contractor are all on the same page on this. So we made the call last week that if they come in and say, you know, we need to have you shut down, then we go to the contractor and we'll shut it down. It's a little bit delayed because of some of the high water, and, and, uh, but the project is still basically on schedule. We still have until October 15th, if not to the end of October, to finish it up. And as I understand right now, I haven't been down to take a look at it yet. Uh, they should be cordoning off that parking lot with K-Rails pretty soon to make sure that all of the equipment is more secure. And uh, hopefully here in a couple of months, we'll be getting the final inspections and have a new boat ramp. I do have to say when I was coming back from Klamath, sorry, or not Klamath, but from my air quality meeting in Eureka, and that was on Thursday. The bridge was covered with people. Now I gave, gave Gia a call even and said, you know, all these people are all over the bridge. My understanding was CD, CHP was kind of taking the lead and we're, we're doing a pretty good mm. job down there, right? Yeah, at that time the, there, the there were just people and no direction. But yeah, when we first started approaching that area, I thought, oh my gosh, there must have been one heck of a wreck, you know? And then when you see all the people, oh, that's right, there's a whale. Yeah, it was, it was good to hear that the younger one is out, and hopefully yeah. the mother will be out soon, and there won't be as much problems on the bridge nor with the construction. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, Tim Hoon is here. Um, the board did ratify a contract for the, uh, this was the National Emergency Grant, the Tsunami Disaster uh, Funding, and Tim approached us after he had also approached uh, the Harbor District in the city to provide some projects for the crews to go out in the county areas and assist and train. And uh, this should be a very uh, positive approach to getting some work done through our parks department primarily, but also even roads. Um, projects that fall through the cracks sometimes because you're doing bigger projects or you don't have enough crews. And uh, my understanding is they're working at Camp Park still, to putting some paint on the bathrooms interior, out exterior. We've already done some of the clearing uh, of the driftwood that was causing access problems on, down at the beach. Also some understory uh, cleanup. They worked out on uh, Radio Road, Point St. George to weedy around the guardrails. Uh, some work that the road department wasn't gonna be able to get to because of the magnitude of their projects. Uh, my understanding is that they would We'll go out to Florence Keller and assist out there, possibly with some paint, but also first would be the, uh, the footbridge, uh, reconstructing that footbridge. And uh, so there's a lot of positives. And Tim, I don't know if you want to mention anything at this point, but uh, a lot of positives coming from it. Hi, Tim Hoon, uh, a county resident. Um, no, it's just the, the crews, there's one week of safety training in the classroom after people are hired, then there's two to four weeks of on-the-job training. And it's doing the, those two to four weeks of on-the-job training that the crews perform uh, work of value to the city, county, or harbor. All the projects are under uh, the direction of those three jurisdictions.
addictions. Um, so that's uh, where we work in the parks or do things that aren't related directly to the tsunami, but they're directly related to training of the crews. And then uh, after that training period, crews go to work on tsunami damage. So that's how that works. Is that part of it? I had seen some workers down on Whalers Island. Uh, down there in the... If it's close to the ocean, that might be uh, tsunami damage. But uh, I just wondered why they were up on Whalers Island. Uh, the, the, the view's I, nice so out there. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but there is uh, quite a lot of work getting done. I think six cords of wood came out of uh, from uh, the logs that were blocking the creek there in Camp Park, and um, uh, they've uh, cut over uh, 1.3 million square feet of grass and all the way over 1,200 bags of trash and trimmed 626 trees. There, there, there's just quite a lot of work in the city. Yeah. Uh, County and Harbor that's getting done. Painted over, uh, jeepers, that's almost uh, four miles of curb, 1,900, really, really 19,000 feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so it's really wonderful. And then so right now there's 175 people uh, all earning a paycheck and with another right. 100 to be hired. That's what's nice. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, can I ask you, yeah. uh, Tim? Where do those six cords of wood go? Uh, not to 1350 Herald Street. Um, <laughs> let me think. Uh, no, I, I think we just put them up at the uh, for campers to use. I, I think that's where they. You should oh. be selling it. We, uh, yeah, yes. I'm not sure where they've actually stored yeah. it. Well, or I even yeah. thought of donating it to the senior program. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll check on that. They but, used to get wood yeah. from people, and I don't think they. They do much anymore. But things like that used to go to the senior program for the, the low-income seniors to heat their homes. Yes. By the way, on a side note, congratulations on the upcoming wedding here. So, oh, thanks, uh, thanks. Did yeah. marry you and Jim? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I figure it's about time, and uh, yeah. yeah. So you're uh, nice. you're looking at the Del Norte County uh, luckiest guy right here. So uh, yeah, getting nice. married to Jody Pell on Saturday. But, uh, but uh, thanks to Jay and the rest of the county to working on this project. It's been really uh, a great working relationship. And we have some fantastic um, kind of management working uh, uh, that are employed on the project. Tim Pierce and Gary Hayes and a whole bunch of managers that are working directly with the, the uh, road crew and, and everyone else. So uh, uh, Knockwood, things are going real smoothly. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Anything else, Jay? No. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for attending.